What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Meadows and Makers podcast, brought to you here on MSP Waves, streaming on YouTube and Odyssey tonight. So, welcome to the show. Hope everybody's been having a good week so far. Uh, tonight, I wanted to talk to you guys about the Urbanite aquaponics system that I've been working on. And I've got some pictures from that build that have been going on. I, I was able to go out to the makerspace on uh, last Friday and uh, <clears throat> last Wednesday we had our, our group meeting for the local Freedom Cell. And I got some help from those guys to get started on getting it set up and getting it uh it's home at the makerspace so that we can that I can show it off and for people that come around to the makerspace that they can you know learn how aquaponics you know learn about aquaponics and I can you know hopefully teach some people about it and um, you know kind of have it be uh, well it'll be a work you know the working prototype for this these, this set of plans. DIY plans that Robbie had made for uh, for this system, so pretty excited about that. I've uh, been working on all of my spare time to get that build done, and I finally got it to a point where you know I can bring it out in public and uh, really cool that I was you know able to get involved with the local makerspace uh, at the Monkey's Wrench. And it gives me an opportunity to get that uh, that out to more people. So, um, super stoked about all that going on, and uh, I've got uh, all that stuff in the works. So tonight, I wanted to share with you guys. You know, just some of that, uh, some of that build process on how I put this thing together and kind of catch you up on some of the other homestead projects and stuff I got going on. Uh, it's coming up on our planting season. Uh, we've got April, uh, is going to be the time that we get, need to get all our seeds in the ground. Uh, Usually by Easter is our last hard freeze, so uh, that's the next thing I need to get going. But um, but yeah, I want uh, for right now. I want to get this uh, aquaponics project done. Uh, like I said, I was able to do this live build at the makerspace and uh, during an event that they were having there. And it was a local biking club that uh, they helped fix up bikes and uh, uh, give them to some of the homeless people in the uh, <laughs> in our community. Uh, oh, okay, you guys need a link. All right, thank you for letting me know. Let me give you guys the link to the... Well, I guess we'll go on the uh, the old YouTube channel here. Uh, share the link, copy the link, and then let me drop that in here. Uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, guess you guys can't hear me. Michelle can't hear me. Um, uh, so there is the uh, <laughs> there is the link to the YouTube channel. So uh, so yeah, you guys can can hop in there and uh, and listen at that uh, at that location so hopefully everything's up and running 
the right way it's supposed to on on that front it look kind of kind of looks like it uh so yeah it looks like everything's running well <laughs> let me know if uh if things are are goofy and i can work on it but uh but yeah so cool you can you're listening on the site all right cool so uh all right sweet everybody we got you we got y'all listening on uh, the link so yeah guys uh just saying that i have been working on this aquaponic system now for probably going on a month just working on it in my spare time and i just wanted to share with you guys some of the steps i took to build the project and so i took some pictures along the way and i've got them all posted on the twitter right now so i'm just gonna pull these up and i'm gonna efap the uh (laughs) all the the twitter pictures so and just kind of walk through uh, some of the steps of this build process with you tonight. And then uh, I'm going to talk about some of the other projects that I got going on on the homestead. Uh, some of the community things that we've had going on. And just kind of catch you catch you guys up on some of my projects and stuff. So uh, this has been the biggest, the, the big project that I have uh, been tackling lately, and uh, it's really it's start it's starting to really come together. So, <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, the Discord has worked, but I see uh, your guys chatting here still. So if you want to chat inside the Discord, I can still see uh, see all that. So. Yeah, it's called e-fapping. It's like a new term that I picked up from other other folks in the uh, streaming. But I guess it, it's like when you're um, <laughs> when you're like reading articles, I guess, and uh, you know, pulling up things, pulling up uh, things on your uh, on your browser window to talk about. I guess is uh, what the e-fap term means. So. Um, the bot is broken. You got to do it from discord or listen on the site. Discord did some kind of update. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think, I think we're rolling. Uh, you guys can all, uh, anybody that is, uh, watching the show, you guys can watch on the YouTube channel. I got one up on Odyssey and then, uh, streaming out to mspwaves.com forward slash watch as well. So streaming out to a bunch of different places. In fact, let me, let me share the Odyssey link as well on my Twitter. If anybody wants to come hang out on Odyssey, we can, can do that. I'm always having issues with like, uh, Odyssey is always like signing me out, like right when I want to, stream so i guess i need a little bit better i need need to do a little bit better job on on doing my show prep and getting ready before i get the stream kicked off but um but uh that's what i'll be doing man i'll be i need to i need to work on that and getting getting prepared a little bit ahead of time for the show. I do have uh, a guest for you guys next week. I have uh, Nicole Sosh. She has a podcast, uh, Living Free in Tennessee. I've talked about her a lot. And she also um, she also runs the Self-Reliance Festival that they are doing up in Cam- Camden, Tennessee. So... Uh, I'll be having her on next week. I will be farm sitting next week for one of the folks in our Freedom Cell group, and uh, feeding their chickens. Uh, they've got some some fish that they raise, and uh, watching over their dogs. So, 
I'll be doing the farm sitting gig next week. Uh, <laughs> I know show prep. Yeah, that's uh, something that is uh, non-existent a lot of times. So, yeah, uh, I just wing it. Most most weeks I am winging it. So, uh, but it would probably be much a uh, much higher quality show if I actually prepared. So, I prepared a little better. I usually have a general idea of what I want to talk about and things that I want to cover. And uh and then I kind of just spitball it from there. But uh Do they eat the chicken and fish or sell them? Uh yes. So they are raising the chickens to uh for the eggs and then they are um butchering some of them to eat as well uh and then they got uh they got the old uh we we i was over there this weekend and uh uh at my friend's place that i'll be farming farm sitting for and they have um uh we did a day of shooting he's got like a shooting range going on at his uh at his place so um so we did a little shooting and then they needed to butcher a few roosters so i helped them do that and uh so i brought out my butcher knives and showed them how to butcher and de-gut a chicken and they're using these killing cones. They have like a, uh, they had like a metal cone to, um, they can, you know, put the chicken in and it kind of hugs it, and then you, uh, then you have to, you know, take off their throat, cut their throat. Um, first time using a killing cone to do that, and it went pretty well. Uh, you really have to, you know, do do a good job on your your cut there, and you have to do it pretty pretty quickly. <laughs> um, Uncle Bonehead, what would they notice if they are missing uh, ten or eleven? <laughs> uh yeah, yeah, pretty sure. <laughs> so yeah, I gotta. I got to do the the farm sitting thing next week. Hopefully, I don't lose all their chickens, and you know, I'm not not going to, but uh, but that would be the end of my farm sitting career. But uh, it was funny as soon as I started, as soon as I talked about that with one of my other friends, they uh, they're raising goats, and so as soon as I told them I was farm sitting for somebody else, then uh, they uh, automatically hit me up to see if I would be able to come and, and milk the goats for him. So, uh, so I'm going to be learning how to milk goats soon here. And I will be looking after their goats while they go on a vacation for a little bit and just making sure that they, you know, stay milked for a few days. So I've got, uh, I've got that coming up. Did the killing cone make it cleaner? Um, Yeah, I mean, there's multiple ways of, uh, you know, butchering a chicken. But, uh, but yeah, the killing cone uh, was a pretty effective way to do it. And, um... She wanted to collect the uh, the blood so that she could use it as like a fertilizer. So you had the cone and she had a bucket up under the cone. <laughs> and uh, so she was able to use that to help with fertilizer. And, uh, and then one cool thing that they had there, which made the job really simple, was they bought a plucker. 
Uh, they bought a really nice plucker system. And I don't know if I can... Let me see if I can pull up a, a picture of this plucker. Um, but it's just like a metal drum and it's got all these like plastic nib nibs on the inside and you know you just run the you just run the motor and then it just like spins up really fast and you throw the chicken in there and it just gets beaten beaten up by this uh by all these little fingers of these like plastic soft uh, kind of soft rubber rubber fingers in there and let me see if I can pull this up for you guys so that you can see but uh, but yeah it's one of the uh, one of these it actually was larger than this and it had a nice feature that you could spray the inside of the plucker and uh, you know it would bring out all the feathers it would get all the feathers uh, out of the plucker system for you and so I don't know if you've ever plucked uh, chicken feathers after you've, uh, uh, if you've ever cleaned a chicken or butchered a chicken, but it it's, it takes a little bit of time if you do it by hand, and um, you got to get the temperature of the the water to singe the the bird to help get the feathers off uh, at the right temperature. You don't want the water boiling, but you do want it like scalding hot. And, um, that's pretty much what it is, man. People do all kinds of DIY projects. Uh, uncle bonehead looks like a dryer drum. Um, people do all kinds of projects to DIY these things, but I mean, they're real simple. You just need, uh, you know, a, a motor to spin these, you know, rubber, uh, fingers up on the bottom and then you got all those fingers on the sides i've seen people make them out of the 55 gallon plastic drums and stuff and uh, uh they 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 went and invested in a nice one and so what we're gonna do as a a group is you know whoever wants access to it you know just pay uh, a portion of uh the price for the chicken plucker and so you just, you know, get um, access to it whenever you need to, uh, you know, butcher some chickens and and put stack them away. So that is what I was up to over uh, this weekend. Uh, Friday Friday night I was working on that uh, aquaponics system, and then Saturday I went over to my friend's place that I'm going to be farm sitting for. Uh, we did the, uh, we had a shooting day and then, uh, helped them do this, uh, chicken butchering. And, uh, I guess they have seen it done before, but they had never done the butchering process themselves. So, uh, so they got to walk through that whole, whole thing. And, you know, I just showed them, you know, how to do the, the cuts to remove, uh, remove the guts and, you know, um, and then, uh, just, you know, showed them the, all that basic process from me doing it a few times. I've, I've had to do it a few times. So <clears throat> I was glad I was able to come in handy for their, their little event there and was able to teach some stuff to, uh, some of my friends in the freedom cell group. So so it was successful Saturday and got to hang out with one of my buddies and watch the UFC fights and got to see John Jones, uh, the main event, uh, Johnny Bones Jones come back in the UFC, I guess is his first fight in several years. And he won by, uh, I think he got a, a rear naked choke on the dude. I think, uh, submission, he got him into a submission of some kind and won the fight in the first round, I think from what I remember. So, uh, it was a good weekend. Uh, Sunday uh, on Sunday, I got to go out to, um, work on getting the baby chickens outside. So 
all the baby chickens were moved out to their outdoor coop chick shaw that i built and they're out there right now uh they've got a lot more room that they were getting tired of the brooder setup that i had for them and uh, they're about fed up with that so uh, they're all outside now, and they've got uh, a whole net over them. They've got electric net around them, and they're in the Fort Knox of a of a chick shaw that I built for them. So, fingers crossed that these guys will stay safe and, and away from all the predators and stuff out there. Uh, because we got a lot of them. We got hawks flying around. We've got owls. We've got foxes. Uh, we've got raccoons. We've got neighbor dogs. We've got all the predators. So, uh, so hopefully I can keep them safe. We've got them, you know, on pretty tight security lockdown right now. I want to. I want them to just kind of hang out in their chick shaw for. Uh, I've got them hanging out in there this week just to kind of get them acclimated to being outside a little bit. And then uh, next week I'm going to let them go whole hog and start going outside to free range and you dig in the dirt and claw up the ground and do their chicken thing out there. So <laughs> you typed in chick. Chick Shaw, and that's what came up. <laughs> uh, Shaq eating some chicken wings and some peeps. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah, the Chick Shaw is just pretty much a, a rickshaw for chickens. And uh, I went a little bit overboard on, on engineering the thing. So, uh, so. So uh, I will be making some videos, not uh, just on that chick shop project, but on this uh, aquaponics build project. So, uh, so yeah, that kind of ca catches you guys up on what I, how my weekend went and uh, the stuff I got accomplished. Always feels good to have a, a productive weekend, and I was able to get uh, several things that I wanted to get done accomplished over the weekend, so I'm pretty happy about that. So let me bring up this aquaponics build for you guys, and I'm going to kind of walk you guys through. I'm going to walk you guys through what I've been working on with this. So you can check it, check it, check, check, check it out. All right, so... I loaded this thing up onto my truck and trailer and brought it out to the makerspace. And this is the uh, stand for the aquaponics system. This is basically just the frame where all of the plumbing and everything is going to sit on this frame. And this was pretty much built out of... Uh, uh, some lumber that Robbie and... Uh, his buddy uh, milled for me so uh, this came from an oak that my neighbor that uh, the uh, from the property that I have uh, down by Smith Lake um, that he gave to me he gave me this log and we split the lumber on it and uh, Robbie's buddy has a sawmill and I, I brought it over there and he uh, cut it for me on the sawmill and uh uh you know i've helped uh robbie work on his uh i helped him fix a water pump on his car and you know it's kind of one of those things where we kind of just help each other out with stuff <clears throat> so um so yeah all the wood from this project pretty pretty much came uh from the sawmill from that oak piece and uh, some reclaimed uh, two by fours and pieces of plywood that uh, that I was able to that I was able to use. But pretty much this whole thing is like solid oak uh, hardwood and some poplar boards on the bottom. So it's pretty it's it's a pretty stout frame. 
after I put it all together. And uh, so, yeah, hauling that thing up to the makerspace, that was a lot of fun. Here's kind of a view uh, of the system pretty much all dry fit and assembled. Uh, I took a picture right after I got most of it assembled. Um, so it was pretty, it was pretty cool. It was like a Friday night and they had this like bite. They do this thing. Uh, I, I don't know if I, they probably do it like once a month, but I think this was like the first time that bike club had gotten together, uh, in a little while and they threw on, uh, threw an event at the makerspace because they've got, uh, part of the club there that they fix up bikes for people and they give them to homeless. And so that's now housed there at the makerspace. So they threw a, an event there on Friday night and I was out, uh, outside building this thing, uh, during, during their event and got to talk to several people about it. And some folks were, definitely interested in what I had going on. So, you know, I explained to them what aquaponics was and, you know, the whole purpose behind the system and stuff. And there were, you know, several people that got to uh, come up and talk to me about it. So, uh, so that was pretty cool. And I got to share some folks with some folks, my, uh, channel. So, uh, they could come check out the build uh, because I am going to make some videos on the process of building this thing. Uh, right now, everything is dry fit and assembled. So I'm going to have to go back through and um, glue all the PVC joints and everything together. So not, not, nothing leaks. But this is a view in this picture right here. Uh, right channel for you guys is one of the first filter tanks um, that the water will run through after it comes out of the aquarium. So the way this is designed is the water is continuously pumped from a sump tank, uh, which sits at the very bottom of the frame and gets pumped up to the aquarium and it will spill over from the aquarium into two filter tanks. And these filter tanks, the purpose of these is to vortex the water. And as the water rises, it's going to be pulling solids from the fish poop from the bottom of the aquarium uh, from a standpipe. And it will suck those solids up and deposit them into uh, the first filter tank. And so the water is going to be vortexing around in here. And so all of that, all that solid stuff will, uh, fall to the bottom as this thing's vortexing, uh, in this first filter bucket, it's just a five gallon bucket with a, um, hole drilled in the bottom to accept, um, a one inch bulkhead fitting. And, uh, and then it drains off into, um, a one inch PVC pipe with a ball valve at the end so that you can collect the solids as they build up in these, in these filter tanks. Uh, so yeah, it'll reach the, the height of the piece of PVC that goes in the center of this, this first vortex filter. And it'll spill out through that into the next uh, filter bucket. And uh, in that one, it has uh, some PVC pipe that's cut at 15 degree angles. And it's got slots in it. And the principle is the same there. The, the water will continue to vortex into the next filter bucket. And then as the water rises, the, um, the solids that weren't caught in this one should get uh, picked up in the next one and that, uh, 15 degree cut PVC at the top of the filter bucket, you know, it should help, uh, prevent any of those other solids from moving further down into the system. 
And also, uh, there will be some shower balls in these in these filter buckets, which will help uh, the natural bacteria. Uh, there's a natural bacteria that uh, you inc- you give it a lot of surface area, and once you get the system started and everything starts to establish, this bacteria starts to convert the fish pee um, into something usable for the roots of the plants. So. Uh, the bacteria does a lot of the work in the system once you get everything established and the pH balanced and all that good stuff that once the chemistry is right, the bacteria starts to take hold and it, um, you know, helps to convert those, uh, night, I believe it's, uh, convert the nitrates to nitrites, uh, that is more usable for the uh, roots of the plants. Um, so yeah, here's what that that looks like. You can see in this picture, you can see the PVC that goes through the bul- uh, a bulkhead fitting in the tank, and this is all in in one inch PVC here. Uh, there will be a, a T piece of pvc that goes uh in on the inside of the tank and then uh the a one inch piece of pvc that goes to the bottom part of the tank and connects to that t and which you'll see a picture of here in a little bit <clears throat> but yeah that's the simple process there is to just continuously pump water up to this aquarium tank and then it will kind of through a siphon effect, it will pull the water off of the bottom of the tank. So there kind of be always a natural um, circulation in the tank. And I want to set the uh, the water coming in to kind of uh, create like a waterfall at the top and to help oxygenate the water in the in the uh, fish tank. So. So that's how that'll be all set up. Uh, Here's a view of the five gallon buckets that we're using for the filter tanks. And you can see it's just uh, uh, at the bottom of the five gallon bucket, it's a one inch bulkhead fitting, which you can find uh, locally at a a tractor supply is where I was able to find these. it's a little bit more difficult to find those at like a Home Depot or a Lowe's, uh, from what I've found. And uh, Tractor Supply usually carries these bulkhead fittings. So I was able to find the ones that I needed, uh, which were uh, an inch and a half, one inch and a half bulkhead fitting for the media bed, the grow bed, where all the plants are going to grow. And then two uh, one inch of these bulkhead fittings for these filter tanks. And then the one that went into the aquarium, uh, most likely, um, I didn't have to purchase that one because we originally, uh, I went to Pet Depot like, uh, this was when they were like super strict about all the masks and everything like that, probably back in twenty. Uh, I guess it was like a little bit after they started all the, uh, lockdowns and everything in 2020. And I went into Pet Depot to buy a tank and they were wanting to, uh, make, uh, have me wear a mask. They were like one of the only stores that really gave me an issue about it. But I remember that specifically, but I went in there because they periodically run these deals where they, We'll sell aquarium tanks for real cheap. They'll sell them for about a dollar a gallon. And I picked up one of those tanks and I brought it down to uh, Robbie's place. And we tried to, uh, using a diamond hole saw bit, to drill for the bulkhead fitting in that tank. And we ended up shattering the glass. And it comes to come to find out... Uh, one, it was probably operator error on my part. Uh, but two, uh, 
I learned that some of these Pet Depot tanks, that they started to temper the glass for the sides of the tanks, especially the larger tanks, like the 55-gallon ones. And so uh, it could have been the glass was tempered and, uh, you know, you just really can't cut a hole into tempered glass uh, because it just shatters on you. So lesson learned there. You got to buy a... Uh, aquarium tank that does not have tempered glass on the sides and supposedly a lot of the uh, aquariums they don't standard come with tempered glass on the sides uh but i think you got to watch out for the ones that you'd buy at like petco or pet smart or any of those any of those pet stores that when they do that like uh maybe it was a, just a fluke but uh, i've watched some um some of these other aquarium guys videos that they were talking, they're talking about it on their videos. So, uh, some of those dollar gallon aquarium tanks, if you want to drill a hole through the side of it to put in a bulkhead fitting of some kind, then you want to look for something with, uh, like a thicker glass and probably stay away from those like, uh, ones that you could buy at, uh, the local pet store. Uh, there's supposedly there's a way you can tell if it's tempered or not based on the color of the glass on the side or whatever. Um, but I'm not entirely sure how you tell. Uh, but one of the channels I was watching uh, where they were talking about these uh, these tanks, they said you want to go for a thicker glass anyway. And, um, and then there's also a jig that they make uh, for cutting holes in um, in fish tank sides. So, uh, all that to say, uh, I, my buddy Robbie gave me this, this fish tank that was already pre-drilled for that hole. So, um, but I'd like to, I'd like to be able to drill, drill one myself. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, aquarium, tank hole grilling jig so one of the one of these guys just showed a a way of doing this where you just use a piece of like three quarter inch plywood so that you can hold the drill uh in the in the correct position and then um he just puts like tape behind it, masking tape and all that. Uh, but a guy that does this a lot, that uh, it works for the, the company I work for currently, uh, he makes a, a lot of these aquariums and he has to drill holes in these aquariums. And he was telling me that they make a, they make a, uh, some kind of jig f for it as well. So, trying to see if I could find something on that right off the top, right off the bat, but uh, I don't seem to find it. But there's like a there's a lot of folks that do this because uh, people having aquariums and uh, doing all that kind of stuff. There's actually a lot of a lot more people that, than I realize that uh, do this as a hobby. A lot of people, you know, have saltwater fish tanks and you know, just raise freshwater fish and all kinds of stuff in aquariums. So it's a big, it's a, it's a big time hobby for, I didn't, I didn't realize how popular it was. There's a lot of people do it. And especially people with like lots of money, they have these huge fish tanks, I guess. Uh, Cause that's what uh, the one, one guy in our, at our company does is he'll do that on the side and he like maintains like this super rich guy's aquarium system. So there's some folks out there like that. Sorry, right, you gotta <clears throat> get a little drink of water there. So, oh, uh, where did I get to? Uh, bulkhead fittings, one inch bulkhead fittings, and then these are uh, inch and a half uniseals that go into the filter buckets as well. And uh, so these these are rubber rubber uniseals. 
Um, and they're really great for if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to put some plumbing in some kind of barrel or a uh, bucket or anything that has like a, that's like irregularly shaped and you want to make a, uh, you want to make it watertight. So, um, you can get them on, you can get, you can buy them off of Amazon or you can buy them from these, uh, Aussie global guys. I think they're like the Uniseal warehouse. Um, so you can get them in like all kinds of sizes of these, uh, of these Uniseals and, uh, they're pretty cheap, but, uh, they are one product that you can't really find locally. And I was kind of wondering myself if, uh, it might be a good, uh, a good candidate for a material called uh, TPU, which is a uh, thermal polyurethane, but it has like a lot of the characteristics of a rubber after you print it so i'm uh i'm somewhat curious to see if there would be a possible to print these in thermal polyurethane and print them out with the 3d printer uh which would be pretty cool because these uh, these guys, you, you can't just go down to your local hardware store and pick these up. You got to order them. Yeah, it's a special order online for them. So, uh, that's something that's one, you know, kind of thing when we're talking about self-reliance on the channel is like, how do, how do I source things? Uh, how do I source stuff locally if I can, um, you know, but, uh, you know, the 3D printer might be a solution for that. All right. So uh, that was basically the first uh, evening of getting this thing all set up at the makerspace. Uh, I uh, was able to put more boiled linseed oil on the the bottom poplar boards and this whole frame was charred, uh, with the blowtorch, uh, with the prote propane torch. I charred the surface of the wood and then I came back with a boiled linseed oil, which you can pick up from the, um, local store. Um, like Lowe's or Home Depot, you can get that bold boiled linseed oil from. Let's see, uh, Uncle Bonehead, would a grommet work? Uh, too much pressure? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by grommet. Um, I guess you could create, if, as long as you could do something where you, you're cutting the hole in, and as long as you can seal around it well, you know, with some kind of caulk or silicone or whatever, um, you know, basically, yeah, a rubber ring. Oh, like a, like a, like an O ring. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it'd be, it'd be kind of finicky. I don't know if you could just do it with an O ring. Uh, You'd have to get like super precision, uh, to, to just use like a, a rubber, rubber O-ring, but I'm sure there's a way to figure it out, uh, if you really wanted to get to it. But these, these uniseals are, you know, they're just a piece of rubber that is made at the specific diameter for PVC and they're real simple to use, so... Um, that's their main purpose is, uh, you know, for some kind of buckets or whatever that you want to, um, create a penetration through and you want it to, you know, be watertight, then, uh, you just get the appropriate size hole saw and, and drill the hole and put the uniseal in and just 
shove your pipe in there and it makes a really nice seal. I used them on the uh, the bigger aquaponics system and uh, all of the water catchment that we have. Uh, I use those uniseals to make the fittings from one tank to the other and just join uh, one tank to overflow into the other tank and then just you know shove those uniseal fittings in there with the appropriate size PVC. And it's, uh, they're really easy to do. So I have, you know, kind of an abundance of uniseals. <laughs> but they come in handy. They're, uh, they're really great. So, uh, what you guys are seeing here is just that, uh, we got those two one inch bulkhead fittings fit on those vortex uh those vortex buckets and they're just five gallon home depot buckets that you you can go down and buy uh at the uh at your local uh big box store uh so pretty accessible you can get those those buckets anywhere you know if you want uh want to go you know get them like uh I think Fire Firehouse Subs has like pickle buckets. <laughs> Uncle Bonehead. Ah, that's hilarious. <laughs> Your mind went to cock rings when I started talking about O rings. <laughs> um so so yeah, you just need a couple of those five gallon five gallon buckets you can pick up from wherever. I think Firehouse Subs they sell those pickle buckets or something like that. Uh, th that would work fine. Like anything that was uh, you know food grade or you know any of those buckets that haven't had anything in them yet. Those five gallon buckets. Uh, so this is a picture of the uh, of the media bed here, and this is. Uh, the assembly of the the bell siphon so on the outside of the bell siphon you have to have a guard to prevent any of the gravel any of the um you know finer particles or uh particles of a certain size let's say from interfering with the bell siphon so you need a guard for it and so this was done using a piece of six inch PVC uh, that I cut to the height of the depth of the grow bed, which was about 11 inches uh, is the, the depth of the bed. And then uh, put a series of 15 degree cuts into the six inch PVC with the miter saw and just went up the PVC from the closest I could get to the bottom of it and then um, on up the sides so that it would cover most of the area uh, of the height of the bell siphon, which was uh, around nine inches because we wanted to uh, make sure that the height of the bell siphon is going to be lower than the total height of the media bed. Uh, because what we don't want to happen is we don't want water to go over the top of the rocks in the media bed. We just want them to uh, go to a certain height, uh, like two inches below the surface of the media bed, so that uh, we don't get any algae or anything growing on the surface of the rocks, uh, which can um, uh, which can be detrimental to uh, the growth of the other. Uh, stuff in in the bed so we just wanted to come up to you know we wanted to come up below the surface um so that's uh how this is all set up so that it, the water can drain uh drain out before any any water reaches the surface of the media grow bed in the thing uh have i had this working yet uh, I don't have it up and running yet. Uh, <laughs> um, 
So, so this Wednesday I'm going to put all the glue in this thing so that I can glue all the pump plumbing together. So nothing leaks. And then, uh, as then we'll fill it up with water and do the final, final checks on the system. Make sure after I did all the glue operation and all that, I don't get any leaks. And then, um, then we'll have to balance the pH of the water, uh, in the beginning. And then I can introduce fish after I get the, after I get the, the, uh, the water's pH all balanced and everything else. So, uh, probably by next week I should have it up and running and, and I can give you, uh, an update on, on how everything's running. So, <laughs> So as Uncle Bonehead, you're saying, I just realized that when shit hits the fan, how screwed I am. I have no successfully built DIY projects, only piles of crap half held together with duct tape and super glue with bent nails. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you got to just keep working on stuff like little by little. Uh, that's just how I've been doing it is just like, Every chance I get is to just go out there and and continuously work on it. Yes, I will be putting up a video of it running and everything's going well and and all that. So I will be putting putting out a video on that and I will be uh, doing a happy dance because because uh, yeah, this is a project that I started a long time ago with Robbie and. You know, I've been wanting to get it done and, um, you know, perfect, uh, perfect time. What better time than now, right? To, you know, get this thing finished. <clears throat> so here's another look at the bell siphon. And this is just, uh, this is a, uh, this is an inch and a half PVC right here. Uh, and that's coming up to nine inches from the bottom surface of the media bed. And this all gets put into an inch and a half bulkhead fitting and uh, a three inch pipe with a uh, end cap goes over this inch and a half pipe. And the three inch pipe is cut to the same height as this inch and a half pipe. And then it creates a small gap when you put the cap on. And that gap is what allows that uh, bell siphon to, to operate. So once the water comes in from the bottom and it reaches the height of this standpipe, uh, the water flowing down from this, this pipe will start to create a uh, siphon effect. And it will drain all of the water from the bed. Uh, pulling it up from the bottom of the three inch pipe with a uh, three quarter inch uh, holes drilled uh, well they're they're like squares uh, in both sides so you can see that in this picture right here is that this is the three inch pipe stacked on top of the inch and a half pipe and then there's a three quarter inch high square <coughs> um, cut out on both sides of the PVC. So, uh, that'll allow enough water to come through here and get siphoned out through the rest of the, the grow bed. And this is how you can maintain a, a single pump. So, so gravity's taking care of all of this action for us instead of having to have like valves and timers and, you know, <clears throat> uh, like more, uh, control systems in the project. So bell siphons are really cool. If you've never, uh, messed around with the bell siphon, it's a pretty neat process to check out. And, uh, that would be probably, a, probably a pretty neat video to show you guys this, this thing working in action. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's basically all it does. As soon as, as soon as the water gets up to the height of that standpipe and it starts falling down into the drain, uh, through the, through that pipe, then it'll start a, 
a siphon and it will drain all that water in there uh, out to a final sump location. So this was a really, this was kind of a tricky part of the process because I had to cut the liner. Uh, and this is like a, I think it's like a 20, maybe like a 20 mil pond liner, something like that. Uh, they, you can just go buy at the, uh, local, uh, big box store. So it's, uh, it's one of those pond liners and I folded it so that it would, you know, I could have it cover the entire bed there. And then, uh, I stapled it down just with some, um, you know, just, I can't remember what size staples they were. Uh, but just with a staple gun, I just stapled all, all around that. And then, uh, to go over everything at the end, I used, uh, some roofing nails, some three quarter inch roofing nails and went around the entire, uh, pond liner and I, uh, hammered in, uh, roofing nails all across that thing. Those, those roofing nails have a wide, uh, top to them. And so they, uh, they work, uh, really well at keeping this, uh, this liner down. So I went back, uh, uh, with the staples along with the staples, I put roofing nails down to make sure that liner would stay in place. And this is just kind of a view of, of that bed. I use this, uh, I use this old device right here to kind of help me find the center of where I was going to place the, uh, the drain in the bell siphon and the bulkhead fitting. And so I use that to mark, uh, the center on the frame, um, and then figure out where uh, my cross members were on the bottom and then made marks on the side as well. And then from there, I was able to uh, cut out a hole in the liner using the, the bulkhead fitting itself. I placed it down on the liner and I used my knife to score the liner and... Um, this is not recommended in the plans if uh, if you go through Robbie's DIY plans because uh, if you screw up cutting that liner, then you just waste an entire liner. Uh, but one trick that I did find that you could do, because I did kind of uh, nick the liner a little bit uh, around the bulkhead fitting, and it, and it was leaking um, from when I tested it out this uh, past Monday. I was out there testing it out and uh, I made a washer out of the same liner and just made it so that it would go and cover the, the area that I had nicked and that seemed to work. I'm crossing my fingers on that. If not, I've got a whole nother liner that I can place in there and cut another hole for the bulkhead to go through and seal up. So I'm crossing my fingers that washer trick works and going to see where that, uh, that leads. Uh, yeah, it's going to run on electricity. So, um, so yeah, but it just runs on one pump, the bell siphon, uh, the bell siphon just works by gravity is what I'm trying to say. So just, just the bell siphon effect, the siphon effect in the media bed works by gravity. So this thing is going to constantly pump water up to that aquarium tank and it's going to flow from the overflow from the top of the aquarium tank. And it's going to feed all those other vortex filters and down into the media bed. The bell siphon is going to drain it down into the sump tank where the, the pump is. And so this thing's just going to like continuously pump and gravity takes care of the rest. So if that makes sense, that's what, that's, that's what's going on with this system. Uh, but yeah, you still need a pump and you still need electricity. But you can, you just need one pump. And the beauty of that is, is that, uh, 
You don't have to worry about timing pumps and, you know, adjusting some kind of timing on the pumps or whatever. And hmm, the pump should stay, you know, free of any kind of things that can block, block it up, like, you know, any of the solids from the fish poop or anything like that, which, which you can have problems with if, uh, you know, you don't have a system where you're removing the, that, those, uh, solids from the system or separating them somehow. Uh, the pumps can get clogged and you'll end up having to pull the, pull the pumps out, you know, clean out all the sludge and, you know, the fish poop and everything like that, you know, uh, and you're going to have to do that over and over and over again. If you just have the fish, if you have your pump in the same tank as the fish, which is what a lot of people do with these systems. And it's a real simple way of doing this, but, uh, over time you just run into so many maintenance issues that it just becomes a nightmare. And so that's the beauty of the way that Robbie designed this was so that it would um, eliminate having to have that issue with your pumps and you can, um, you know, operate that pump without any, any obstructions or anything getting in the way because all that stuff gets taken out earlier uh, through these filter tanks and through the, the finally the media bed uh, should take care of all that kind of stuff. So. So that's the beauty of the way he designed this system. And it's really uh, came from, you know, the years that he has been doing aquaponics. So you, you, you put all this together into this design. And this is, you know, uh, for somebody that wants to have a, a cool looking, you know, fish and plant system in their backyard that they could, you know, build something like this. And you could have a, a neat, uh, a neat little food system. You don't even... Uh, if you had a place like, uh, like a basement or something like that, um, that has a good concrete surface, uh, of some kind, then you could, you know, even do this or, you know, like a backyard patio or something like that. You could do this on that. No problem. Uh, and have like a kind of a neat feature for your house. And, uh, you know, you could be growing, growing, uh, food and stuff out of it as well. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Uncle Bonehead, you could use uh, all the leftover COVID masks as filters. Greta would be happy. I'll tell you what, man, there sure are a bunch of those things laying around everywhere. You know, all these people that want to say they're, they're being green and everything, being uh, caring about the planet and all that kind of stuff, they're the ones throwing their masks on the ground. And, um, Wearing the masks and being nice little slaves. <clears throat> so, here is a picture of the uh, one of the filter tanks, like I told you guys earlier. It's uh, once again, this is inch and a half PVC, and there's 15 degree slots cut in the top uh, or cut. Um, into these sections of PVC. And I think these were both three inch sections from what I remember when I was putting all this together. Uh, they're pretty much just like three inch sections of, uh, inch and a half PVC that I cut 15 degree slots into and, uh, and an inch and a half T fitting, uh, and an elbow there at the bottom. So, you can see the inlet coming from the other filter tank at the bottom of that bucket right there. So the water will spill into this next filter bucket and, uh, it should, uh, it should kind of swirl as it, uh, is going through the bucket there. And then if it, there's any other leftover solids that they should fall to the bottom and then, uh, the overflow, uh, from the bucket will come out through the the PVC uh, cut with those cuts at the top there and then drain down into the the media bed the grow bed where everything's gonna be uh, gonna be growing so uh, that's that's a view of of that 
in the first bucket, there's just a, a uh, an inch and a half PVC uh, on an on a 90 degree elbow that just comes up uh, in that first bucket. And here is an easy way to fit the PVC through the uniseals is you need some kind of oil. You can use like vegetable oil. You can even use like a Dawn, like a Dawn dish soap. Uh, but uh, these uniseals make such a great uh, fit that uh, you have to, you need to bevel the edges of your PVC so that it helps slide in through the uniseal. And then you need to use some kind of lubrication to help get it into the uniseal uh, because it just, it's such a tight fit that um, once you push it in one way, it's hard to get it back out the other way. So you kind of have to like gauge the distance you're going to need and um, you, uh, you, you can get another shot at it, but you, you kind of have to rip the whole thing out and you kind of have to. It's kind of a pain. So uh, the easiest way is to just cut a bevel or grind a bevel into the edge of the PVC and then put some, some kind of oil on it to help push it through the uniseal fitting. So I just took a picture of this just to show, you know, how, how you would do that there. It makes it a lot easier. So here's just another picture of that it's after I dipped it in oil. You can kind of see the bevel on the edge of the PVC pipe. It's not just a straight edge coming off. It's kind of rounded. Um, so that makes that a lot easier going into the uniseal fitting. So, yeah, here's the picture of uh, me dipping it in the oil. And uh, so here's kind of an overview of the entire system assembled. And so you can see what I was talking about here where you have the, the T fitting. Um, let me see if I can maybe zoom in this picture a little bit better. Maybe not. Uh, <clears throat> but here is the one inch T fitting in the inside the aquarium and it's got a standpipe that goes down to the bottom of the aquarium tank. And so, uh, it just, it goes like this here in this bin at the bottom is where the, all the water will finally co collect. And it's what's called this, the sump tank, uh, from the sump tank, the pump will pump the water back into the aquarium. Uh, once the aquarium reaches the height of this standpipe, this is open to the air. So, um, so the water level will like to overflow and maintain its level, uh, right at the position of the, of the T fitting here. And since the pipe goes, uh, down to the, the bottom of the aquarium, the water will flow from the bottom of the aquarium. It'll, it'll suck up any water, um, from the, the bottom there and that it'll basically create a, a siphon that maintains the water level around the uh, T here. And uh, so all those solids will be moving from the bottom of the aquarium. They'll get pulled up via the siphon effect and gravity <clears throat> through the PVC here. They'll enter the first tank and it'll swirl and vortex and, Solids should fall to the bottom. Uh, they'll reach the standpipe, which is the inch and a half PVC. They'll f uh, overflow from that bucket into the next filter bucket. Uh, same process will happen there. The water will fill this up. The water will get to the height that uh, those, those inch and a half uh, fittings were set at. It'll overflow from that and then into your media bed. Your media bed will fill up with water till it gets to the height of the bell siphon. That siphon effect gets triggered, uh, and gravity pulls the water back into the sump tank. So that's uh, that's the process and how all that works out. 
Uh, here's just another view from the side here. You can see the drains that come off of those two filter tanks so that we can pull off the solids from the fish waste. And um, those solids uh, from the fish waste uh, make a really good fertilizer for your soil gardening uh, beds. And uh, really great to put around fruit trees. Um you know, just like kind of any uh, any kind of plant that you're growing that's going to need a lot of uh, uh, like manure or, you know, nitrogen. It's going to need a lot more nitrogen. Uh, that fish poop uh, does a really good job uh, as a fertilizer. So uh, like fruiting trees and uh, stuff like that. What's up? All right. We'll see you later, Uncle Bonehead. Thanks for hanging out in the chat tonight. Appreciate you hanging out. And uh, hope you have a great night. So, yeah, this is just uh, the overview of that system and how you can... Uh, these uh, these two uh, ball valves on the ends here are connected to those buckets so you can drain off those those fish solids. And go put them on your garden beds if you if you would like. Uh, here's just another another view, and you can see that standpipe that goes into the aquarium here, and how it uh, that piece of PVC goes down to the the bottom of the aquarium tank. And uh, this aquarium tank took me a little while to reseal everything. I, I went over that in one of the uh, last podcast, but, uh, but that's a whole process in and of itself. If you ever have to repair an, aqua uh, repair an aquarium tank, you have to strip all of the old, uh, silicone out of it. And then you, um, wherever your leaks at, it's probably, uh, for instance, this, this tank, it was a separation of the silicone from the glass in the tank. And so, uh, so yeah, I had to strip out all the old silicone and then s actually take a razor blade in between the glass. And, uh, it was, it was on the bottom of the tank to get the rest of that silicone to help it separate that glass and then re-silicone everything with a type one silicone that, uh, is not meant for outdoors outdoor use because they put some kind of like uh, antimicrobial stuff in there which would be harmful for your uh, uh, your aquaponic system uh, and your fish <clears throat> so use a type 1 uh, silicone and uh, reseal reseal the whole thing just put fresh silicone it down uh, use masking tape and before it cures, uh, after you've spread it with like a nitrile glove and just your finger in the corners, then you just lift up that masking tape and it makes really nice looking um, beads of the silicone on the sides of the aquarium. So, so that was fun doing that, uh, resealing that aquarium tank and everything. But uh, but yeah, these these fifty five gallon tanks, I don't think they're they're that cheap, uh, and so you know saving the aquarium tank was a was a big deal to get that so that I would hold water for this system. Uh, here's just a, a picture of uh, the bell siphon that comes off and into the sump tank uh, from the bottom from the bottom view. And like I said, none of this stuff is glued together yet, so it's all kind of uh, kind of leaky. But here was a leak test that I did on Monday for that uh, bulkhead fitting, and uh, and after I made that washer for it, I seemed to be holding water there for the for around the bulkhead. I couldn't tell if there were any leaks around the bulkhead fitting after I put that uh, other pond liner washer in there, so. I think it's all sealed up as far as that goes, and I just need to PV PVC glue uh, the stuff together now. And, uh, yeah, once once I get everything glued, then 
we can fill this bed up with rocks and get all the water in there uh, and start running the pump and start balancing the pH in the system and everything should be groovy and I just need to throw in some fish and get some get some fish food on an automatic feeder of some kind and the thing will be up and running and I'll make sure to get some video of the whole thing uh, in operation so that I can share that with you guys. But, uh, but yeah, that's been a big project that I've been working on for a while. Just wanted to give you guys a walkthrough of how that system works and how all that stuff is going down. Uh, and Maybe I'll make it kind of, kind of just giving you an idea of how this whole thing went together and the process of doing that. So, so yeah, I've got, uh, uh, next week I'll have a guest on the podcast, uh, Nicole sauce. She does a podcast, living free in Tennessee. And she is one of the founders of the, uh, self-reliance festival that goes on in Camden, Tennessee at John Willis's, uh, special operations equipment, uh, company and his, uh, his compound that he has there. So let me see if I can, uh, pull her website up. Let me see. It's right here. She's been uh, super huge in the uh, homesteading space. She's got her own coffee company, um, Holler Holler Roast Coffee. Uh, she uh, does the um, what do you call it? She roasts her own coffee. She's got a coffee roasting uh, business. Does that? She runs the Living Free in Tennessee podcast. And like I said, she does the uh, Self-Reliance Festival, which is coming up on um, March uh, 25th through the 26th. And there's a uh, there's it's <clears throat> its own website. It's got its own uh, website for this. Uh, you can also find it through Nicole's website on Living Free in Tennessee. But uh, here's here is uh, the self reliance festival dot com is where you can uh, go check that out. But she will be coming on the podcast next Tuesday. Uh, she'll be on live with us. So um She'll be a really great guest. I've been following her for a long time. We met uh, in person at the Rogue Food Conference in 2021. Uh, and then got to go uh, to the very first Self-Reliance Festival. And I think I was there when they first started talking about doing this uh, this festival. Uh, because John, I think John and Nicole met there at the rogue food conference and got to talk to each other about, you know, maybe starting an event and, uh, you know, they've been doing a really great job ever since the, what I really like about this festival is that you've got a lot of makers and doers, you know, people that are out, uh, you know, building projects, you know, doing, doing stuff and there's workshops, uh, while you're at the festival so you can <clears throat> kind of get your hands on uh, some different stuff and live demonstrations. <clears throat> uh, I think the workshop that they're going to do this time before the festival is uh, going to be put on by a guy named Bear Independent. And I think he's going to go over like trauma, uh, first aid type stuff. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, I think that's all the stuff uh, that's going on with the Self-Reliance Festival for this uh, this next one that's coming up. 
But uh, but yeah, they even have a digital pass that they're selling now, so that you can uh, you can go and watch some of the stuff from the event. Uh, I know that they do stream uh, the event. They started to set up a, a streaming of the event on certain people's channels and stuff. So, um, and then I guess they are going to be recording all these things, but, uh, but yeah, this is a really great event. And if you're in the Southeast that I highly recommend going to check it out, there's a lot of really like-minded people there. Um, you know, a lot of other people, Content creators are there, guys that are doing really neat stuff uh, and trying to teach other people uh, how to do it too because, um, you know, we're all going to need to, you know, find other other like-minded people and, and you know, be able to uh, support each other as best as possible, especially if you do – you know, especially if you see what's coming down the pipeline and, and you, you know, you just want to be separate. You want to separate yourself as much as you can from the, you know, the current uh, kind of a technocratic future that seems to be rolling out in front of our eyes. Uh, I was listening to Chrissy Mayer's podcast today. Uh, I really enjoy uh, listening to her podcast, but she had a, uh, a guest on from the U.K., and just talking about, you know, some of the different things that are happening there in, in the UK. Uh, you know, it's like the literal thought police over there now where, you know, you're going to get, uh, there's, there's some videos of, uh, ladies getting, uh, arrested for praying in front of a, uh, praying silently in their heads in front of a, uh, like a Planned Parenthood type facility, like an abortion clinic. And then uh, there was another story she was talking about where um, some boy brought a Koran to school on a bed or something like that. And then they uh, like uh, like were dragging the Koran around or something like that. And then like they had to do this like whole apology, like a whole PR apology campaign or whatever about it. So, uh, you know. There's, there's stuff like that going on. And then, you know, the recent events that happened in uh, East Palestine, Ohio, uh, where they want to get everybody like some kind of uh, medical ID bracelet, which was happening before the event happened. And, uh, so, you know, you know, all this kind of stuff just kind of adding up. And if you can look at the, you can look at some of these guys' own books, like uh, Klaus Schwab's book on the Fourth Industrial uh, Revolution <clears throat> that we covered in a couple podcasts ago. That uh, you know they're talking about all the plans that they they want to roll out, and uh, so yeah, you know if you if you're gonna want to speak your mind or you know do anything against the 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 um, against the herd and the, you know, popular culture, then you're going to have to, uh, you know, find ways around it. So, so that's what this show is all about is trying to give, you know, some folks, uh, you know, some ways that you could get around the system and just be more, you know, at least move in a direction of more self-reliance in your life. It's not uh, it's not an easy task by any stretch of the imagination to become like fully autonomous and independent, <clears throat> but I think it's it is a goal worth striving for, and um, so that's why I like to talk about it. It's it's, uh, it's my passion is to get as uh, self reliant as I can, and. Uh, you know, share share some of the things that I'm learning along the way. So, um, so yeah, farm sitting uh, coming up. Uh, Nicole Sauce next week. So check that out. 
let me give a shout out to uh, all my other homies in uh, the, in the space here. Uh, let me let me shout out Derek Bros real quick. Uh, he has a um, uh, in the Conscious Resistance. They are uh, working on um, raising some funds for their Conscious Agora uh, project right now. And let me see if I could pull up his fundraiser that he's got going on. I'm not sure if he has it posted on his Twitter. Might might have been a while back, but um, at the latest uh, Greater Reset event, they they launched the uh, their Conscious Agora project, and uh, we're talking about that a little bit here. So let me see if I can pull that up and share that with you guys. Uh, if I can find it. Um, but if I can't find it right off the bat here, uh, it looks like uh, it looks like Derek might also be given another run at uh, uh, trying to uh, go in for. Mayor of uh, of Houston, I think he's going to do that again just to get the word out on uh, on everything that's going on. So, yep, he's got that going on. But he also looks like he's got the second edition of his book, uh, How to Opt Out of the Technocratic State which is now available on his website. So let's see that, uh, that can be another way that folks can support him. So yeah, you can go check that out here. Check out his, uh, how to opt out of the technocratic state book. And then if you go, uh, I believe if you go on his website, I think he might have something about his, uh, the Conscious Agora project. The Conscious Resistance Network. Let's see if he still has that up somewhere. But, uh, but yeah, shout out to Derek. And everything that he's got going on, and uh, all of this, all that he does with his activism, he's a he's a really big inspiration for myself. I, I sent uh, I sent Derek an email to see if I can get him on the podcast as well, um, and I know he's he's busy as hell. But uh, trying to get him to come on and have a conversation, talk about uh, what he's doing with the Conscious Agora and the property that they got going on down there in Mexico and uh, all the stuff that he's up to currently. Uh, So big shout out to him. I wanted to uh, remind you guys of uh, the Let's Make Some Shit podcast. Uh, with uh, Radical Resonance, this is uh, a podcast that uh, Sek Magora's wife and her friend uh, put on together. And they just talk a, a lot about DIY projects, a lot of the stuff, you know, a lot of similar stuff that, uh, that I talk about. But uh, you can go check them out on uh, Anchor and Spotify. They have their show as a podcast out there on those platforms. Um, that latest one with sh- their guest, Sean Michael about the mushrooms was really informative. I thought it was really cool. And then, uh, Agora, the podcast, there's other friends, um, which goes, you know, they cover a lot of the stuff like, you know, some solutions talking about, you know, some of these solutions on, um, uh, a, a
you know, some, some of the applied solutions that they are working on and then some like more theoretical discussions on, you know, different implementations of, uh, agorism. Uh, and they got a really cool show. Uh, the, the recent, uh, podcast he did with Ernest Hancock on, uh, on his podcast, Declare Your Independence, it was a really good listen, um, where they talked about, you know, s- some of this stuff with, like, guerrilla gardening and freedom cells and, you know, just being more self-reliant, you know, he's got, uh, doing his own, uh, landscaping company and they're selling products off their homestead and, you know, <clears throat> good with their neighbors and got all that, all that good stuff going on. Um, this, uh, this goat milking is going to be interesting. Uh, it'll be the first time I've ever, I've ever milked goats before. So, uh, so yeah, they've got a whole machine, I think for it and everything. It's just, uh, just corralling the goats, I guess. Uh, I helped my buddy Daniel with, uh, all of his sheep and, and he, has to go through this process with his sheep because he's got a very specific breed of sheep uh, called the Australian White. And you can't just import the live animals across this uh, uh, international, across countries, I guess. Uh, there's restrictions on that, so he has to artificially inseminate the sheep with... Um, with the help of uh, a guy that knows how to do that, they hire a guy uh, to come up and help them with that. So they have like these special racks and everything to like do the whole process because they have to make an incision and then they have to like inject uh, uh, the sperm and everything and they have to like do this whole thing with progesterone with, uh, the sheep and everything. It's, it's pretty wild. It's like, uh, like humans getting abducted by aliens or something like that. And then they're doing all kinds of experiments on you and stuff. So it's like, that must be what it feels like for the sheep. <laughs> and it's kind of a weird process actually. But, um, uh, but yeah, I've helped him, helped him work on that and kind of move sheep around and stuff. So I have some familiarity with with some of those animals, but I've never, never really uh, worked with goats before. So we'll see how that goes. We'll see. Let's see if I can pull pull up a picture of these Australian white sheep for you guys. Coming up on the end of the podcast here, we've got about a half an hour left with you guys. Um, Australian white USA is this this uh, maybe my buddy's farm yeah <clears throat> AW USA this is my buddy's farm right here uh, so so I'll play a little play a little video here for you guys that uh, that he's got on uh, his website here. Guess it's just a video of the sheep, how they look out in the grass and everything out in the field. <laughs> he's a he's a sheep uh, inseminator, <laughs> Rhonda. <laughs> it's yeah, it's all like artificial insemination. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of wild. So let me read, I'll read a little bit about uh, the breed here. Australian white was developed uh, on the Tati Keel properties in Black Springs, uh, NSW, Australia by two brothers, Graham and Martin Gilmore, over several years. 
and was launched in 2011 utilizing embryo transfer, artificial insem- insemination, and selective line breeding. The best characteristics of four breeds, Pole Dorset, White Dorper, Texel, and Van Roy were used to develop the Australian White. The original design was to be a self-replacing meat sheep that sheds its own hair, can ex- can survive in extreme weather conditions from cold and wet to hot and arid environments, early maturing and breed year-round. During the development of the breed, its unique eating qualities were evident. However, it was not until later November 2016 that the scientific reasons for its excellent eating qualities were discovered. The first Australian white embryo transfer program was done in 2010 at Tatakil Properties. Since then, many programs have been conducted each year at the farm with animals going through rigorous selection and continually improve the desired traits, conformation, and eating quality. The Australian white breed can now be found all over the world in countries such as New Zealand, China, Inner Mongolia, and the United States. In 2018, Fagerman Farm brought the first Australian white genetics to the U.S. and began uh, upbreeding available hair breeds to a pure breed Australian white F5 cross now recognized as an American white. The goal of the American white was to maintain the meat quality of the Australian white while building flock numbers and utilizing available genetics in the U.S. So let me just read to you a little bit about uh, the the meat quality that you get with these guys. And, uh, and um, this is my buddy just down the road. Uh, as luck would have it, the meat quality traits of the Australian white are the biggest distinguishing factors of the breed. Tatakil has conducted extensive uh, testing on the intermuscular fat and fat melting point of the Australian white. The fat melting point is significantly lower between 80 or 82 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Typical limb is 110 to 43 degrees Celsius, achieving a similar result to that of Wagyu beef, which generally has a fat melting point below body temperature of 98 uh, Fahrenheit, 36 Celsius, without the need for long-term grain feeding. (laughs) Traits such as uh, the intermuscular fat and the fat melting point are indicative of the amount of long chain omega-3 fatty acid levels and have an effect on taste and tenderness. Polyunsaturated fats in part long chain omega-3s are known to aid in cardiovascular health as well as many other benefits. The average Australian white lamb has significantly elevated levels of omega-3s when compared to other breeds in popular consumer red meats. So... Uh, so yeah, I've had the lamb and it is, uh, it is really good. Um, it's a lot, it's a lot different, you know, if you, if you have eaten lamb before, um, it, it doesn't have that kind of lamb taste to it. It's like if somebody gave it to you on a plate, uh, you know, it would be hard to tell if it was, if it was a lamb, it's like has a really, uh, really good taste to it. Like I've eaten at the Brazilian, like steakhouse places, and like you know when you when you're served lamb, you can kind of has a distinct taste to it. <clears throat> but that uh, that breed of lamb is like uh, like they say, like the wagyu beef of sheep, and uh, it's a really really high quality meat. Um, and uh, yeah, my buddy's trying to be like the like the big producer of that uh, type of sheep uh, in the country. So uh, if you want to read more about that, you can go check out that uh, Australian White USA.com. I think he's got another website where they sell all the stuff at. Um, which is uh, Fagerman Farms I'm pretty sure yeah 
and he's got different um, different cuts of meat that you can buy. Uh, if you go on their on their website, he's got you know individual cuts, and you can buy buy the the brats and the ground lamb. Uh, typically, what I do, like uh, try to do every month, is uh, go buy the uh, brats and the ground lamb from him. <clears throat> which is really good. I've also had the, uh, I've also had like the shoulders, shoulder roasts, uh, that you can, uh, uh, that you can do. Uh, where is that at? Uh, the, the rump roast I've had. Um, and it's, it's all really good. So, check that out here's here is a link to that as well and check that out they'll ship it they'll ship it to your house <laughs> and buy buy a box of meat from them and they're just down just down the road from me um Big, big talk on biochar. We've been talking about that for a while. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out the best solution I can, uh, I can come up with for a bio biochar retort. And I was thinking about it today. And I think uh, so. So we watched the video from Porterhouse and Teal a little while back, uh, homesteaders on YouTube on how they built their biochar retort system uh but i've been thinking about it and how i could do this because i'm having a i'm having an issue finding one of those 30 gallon metal steel barrels um locally and i was kind of thinking about you know what if i just took like an old propane bottle and and chop the top off of it and uh could use that as the sealed container um you know I, i'll drill holes in the bottom of the propane tank it's like an old used propane tank you know fill it with water first make sure all the the propane's out of it before i cut into it uh but just use that propane tank as the the i guess the chamber for putting in all the carbon material to heat up and pyrolyze uh and turn it into um turn it into the biochar but um now that uh i'll look up some stuff there's like all kinds of all kinds of different people doing different stuff with uh, with this biochar. It looks like uh, people are doing it on, uh, you know, some some larger scales. But I'm thinking, you know, I just want to have something for the for the homestead. But uh, but yeah, let's check out this video real quick. It's like a four minute video here uh, that uh, I just ran across on these guys made their their own biochar kiln. This video is an introduction to the ROCC kiln. It is a rotatable covered cavity kiln for pyrolytic production of biochar and thermal energy. As a pyrolytic kiln, it controls the supply of air to prevent the complete combustion of the charcoal that is being created by pyrolysis. The ROCC kiln is rotatable on demand this is to accomplish the physical mixing of the biomass inside the container so that all of the biomass will have access to sufficient heat to complete pyrolysis. Pyrolytic devices come in a wide variety of technologies and sizes. Sizes are represented here. Hi, Rondon is saying that Cody's lab uh, has some good videos on how he's making biochar. So, so yeah, let's check out, let's check out one of his videos there.
that to the ranch, dropped it off here, and let it dry all summer. Now, I have another barrel which I'll be putting this inside of. This is a 55 gallon drum. Okay, so, first thing I need to do is move a bunch of those sticks and pack this barrel pack. Okay, so he's just using like a metal trash can. Uh, yeah. That might be what I could do. Chips, you might get a little bit on the outside turned to charcoal, but the stuff on the inside would be insulated and would never convert. All right, lids on. Let's set this on the scale and see what we got. Okay, looks like about 57 pounds. Give or take a little bit. Okay, so here's the burn barrel, now packed with the starter wood. Now I've used about half the amount of wood as I had in that barrel. Now this might be more than I need, but it is better to heat the charcoal more rather than to heat it less. If it doesn't cook all the way, I'm going to have to burn it again, and that's going to use a lot more fuel. So I may as well burn it now. So the wood that's in this barrel, as it gets heated, will produce gases, and those gases are flammable, and those will burn kind of along the side of the barrel, and that'll help heat it and perpetuate the cycle. In fact, there's plenty of energy here in the wood gas to completely char all of the wood that's in there. The issue is, it's not going to just do it on its own. I need some starting energy, and this system is fairly inefficient, so I need quite a bit. Okay, little barrels in the big one. And I'm just about to light it. There's a couple of things you might notice. One, the little barrel sticks up a bit, and the stack's not on. Partly because the little barrel sticks up and it wouldn't fit on there. But I've actually found that as this fire is getting going and it's starting to get burning, the stack makes no difference. And in fact, it increases the amount of smoke because the wood gas that makes it up into here doesn't get enough oxygen to burn. In the past, what I've done is actually uh, do some log Tetris and pack all that wood down tight enough that this barrel fits and to get the stack on. But after seeing that the stack actually makes things worse, I find it's not worth the time to do that extra work to pack the wood in there. Just throw it in randomly. All right, let me fast forward to see how well this comes out for him. Let's see. <clears throat> Ran out of gas and it's starting to cool. <laughs> Okay, here it is, completely burned down with the stack off. You can see right around here is where it receives the most scale, iron oxide development. Okay, let's see what we got for weight. Like about 24 pounds. So if we started with 12, it means we have about 12 pounds of charcoal out of the 45 pounds of wood. There's my charcoal. Looks like we had a complete burn. Yeah, it looks like uh, that comes out to a really good quality. Okay, so it looks like you just took like a metal trash can and just like uh, hammered down the top so that it would uh, fit fairly well inside of the 55 gallon <clears throat> barrel. I like it. I like it. I might have to go that route because uh, I haven't haven't been able to find one of those uh you know smaller like 30 30 gallon uh containers 
laying around anywhere. But those uh, those metal trash cans, you can find those everywhere. So, so yeah, I want to try to feed this uh, biochar stuff to my chickens, like make it part of their, throw it in with their bedding and everything, and then um, and just kind of throw it in with the compost system so that it uh, works into the compost. Uh, it's supposed to be really great for, you know, when you're, when you're starting seeds as well. Uh, you know, it helps her, uh, retain water and then, you know, all the benefits of, uh, bringing in the microbiology and all that kind of stuff. So y you have to inoculate it first. And then, uh, Jack Spirko has been talking about, he's playing around with the biochar right now. And, uh, he was talking about once you make it. You know, the different ways of uh, chopping, you know, chopping it up into the, the grain size that's uh, the most beneficial for like throwing into your compost and throwing into your gardens and garden beds and all that kind of stuff to get the, the appropriate, uh, the appropriate size of it. And he said what he's starting to do is actually to take this stuff and get it damp and then throw it into uh, a wood chipper and that way it doesn't create a bunch of dust and stuff but it's still chopping it up into uh, fine enough particle size uh, which is which is a pretty cool uh, idea as well I think um. <laughs> thank you man yeah Cody's lab is uh, a that's really good, and thank you for the compliment on the beard, Rondon. It's been going for a while. Uh, probably working on a couple years on this beard. But uh, but yeah, that is what I got going on tomorrow. Or sorry, the uh, next week's podcast we'll be having Nicole Sauce on the uh podcast to talk uh about her story You're gonna ask you know how she got started on her journey um getting into podcasting and doing the homestead and you know why she she decided to go down that path i know i know a little bit about uh her background and her story um so we're gonna get more into that uh with her next week um uh, on the live stream and then I'll, I'll be putting out a, uh, a promo for that so that we can get, uh, everybody tuning in for that one. I can get some, uh, questions from you guys. If, uh, if you have any during the podcast, um, I'll probably, uh, I don't know if I like for, for, for the guest interviews, if I should save some of the questions for the end or just field them in as they, as they come. Um, but, uh, but yeah, maybe I'll, uh, I'll d get the interview going and, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, get those and then I'll save, uh, some of the questions for the end of the podcast, uh, and then we'll uh, field, field the questions towards the end uh, to get those in from the audience. So, um, so yeah, something, something was goofy about the, the Discord bot tonight. <laughs> Hopefully you have the Discord bot working by then. Um, but, yeah, man, uh, we'll fit. Uh, We'll figure it out. Crimson Clad, Rondon, thank you guys for hanging out with me tonight. Um, got a little bit left in the show. Uh, let me shout out one more of my uh, folks, which is Daggerus, and his company there is Agris Acres where he is selling seeds for your gardens for this gardening season. So if you'd like to help support a fellow uh, liberty-minded individual, then um, you can go shop with him at Agorist Acres. And 
grab some seeds for the upcoming planting season. There. Um, really great. He sends you seeds and, you know, nice little ball, bottle uh, and really nice packaging. And uh, so, yeah, those little seed containers he has uh you know you can reuse them for other seeds and stuff and you know he just puts uh puts care into sending out those seeds to you um so so yeah i like supporting other folks like that that got their their own uh, little businesses going on uh another friend that came on the podcast is uh she's got her own uh, uh etsy shop at uh, du- duality duality handmade on etsy and she makes uh, really cool shirts and stuff let's see duality handmade etsy did i see let me see if i can pull up her etsy shop duality handmade pretty sure that's her etsy handle um not finding it right off the bat here let me see if i go directly on etsy But yeah, she does custom shirts and uh, and some other neat stuff. Oh, well, bummer. So she's got posted on here that um, due to major sudden life sh- changes, her shop is on hiatus currently. But uh, so. So anyway, I, yeah, I know she's been going through some shit. I saw some of her posts on Twitter that uh, she recently broke up with um, her boyfriend and stuff. So it looks like she's got her shop on pause. But uh, let me let me do one one final plug. But this is her shop on Etsy, Duality Handmade, uh, from when she gets everything back and running. Uh, you guys can go check that out. And Liberty Under Attack is going to be my final plug for the evening. <laughs> from my my buddy uh, Shane Radliff over there at Liberty Under Attack, where you can get uh, your uh, your ghost phones, your ghost laptops, if you want to. Get a privacy, more privacy-centered laptop, like as a like a backup. You can also, he's got several different books that he's got for sale on the uh, on the website here. Um, that uh, about the philosophy, you know, of uh, agorism and you know just some different. Uh, some different strategies towards self-liberation so you guys can go check him out on there (laughs) i love that meme i think i saw that one recently only do what your heart tells you and the heart is saying commit tax fraud (laughs) you got it boss i love it all right, guys. So appreciate you guys coming to hang out with me tonight. Uh, thank you, Crimson Clad. Thank you, Rondon. Uncle Bonehead was in here for a little while. I uh, hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your week, and I'll catch you guys uh, next week uh, for the podcast with uh, Nicole Sauce. So, uh, y'all have a great one. Appreciate you guys, and we'll, we'll see you. We'll see you next week. Peace.